In the last talk, we got to know the EDRI, an European umbrella organization fighting for digital civil rights. And now we got to know two persons, one from France and one from Poland. Please give a warm welcome for Kasia Szymilewicz. She's from Poland and a human rights lawyer, activist. and co-founder of Panopticum Foundation, which is also a member of EDRI, and also another welcome for Jeremy Zimmermann, co-founder of La Quadrature du Net from France. I hope you have a nice talk. Mm -hmm. Can you hear us? Yes. So it works. It works. It works. Good. That's already something. Hi, Kasia. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. So we've been introduced already. Um, be aware that I'm in a strange mood today. I, you know, I'm usually supportive of freedoms online, yada, yada, you know, fundamental rights. This is usually my kind of stuff, but I don't know, I, I woke up this morning and uh, I was filled with doubt. I was filled with doubts, and I came here, I see all those beautiful people, you know, using Mac computers, hooked on Facebook and Twitter, and actually I was wondering, well, do we really need all this data protection thing? You know, because there is this, this very complex bit of text that is going on that is being currently negotiated in Brussels about privacy, personal data, how to get control of all this. And I don't know, I feel like a bit of the devil's advocate today. So if you quote me uh, on Twitter, for instance, uh, don't hesitate to use the uh, cynical hashtag or something like this. But, um, but really, I, I, was, I was wondering, do, do, we, do we really need data protection in this world? Because I walk the corridors in, in Brussels in the European Parliament from time to time, and I see those hundreds of friendly lobbyists. They, they're really friendly, you know, they're very neat looking and they have very careful words. They come from very respectable industries such as Google, Facebook, Yahoo, well, the whole of Silicon Valley, banking industry, uh, insurance industry. You even have lobbyists from the US government, and they all say the same. So could they really be wrong? They say that if we have more protection of our personal data, well, we, it would be loss of jobs, loss of growth. And I mean, I, we need jobs. We need growth, right? So do we really need this data protection is really what I'm wondering today. And I have the tough task of responding to these uneasy questions that Jeremy is posing. Well, in fact, if I were a corporate lobbyist myself, I would definitely not fight for a stronger regulation. I would think of banks, I would think of insurance companies, I would think of many companies that in the past struggled against regulations Maybe I would ignore the fact that from the perspective of time, it turned out to be quite good to have some banking regulation after all. But I wouldn't fight for that. I would invest my time on the other side. But let me explain you a little bit more about the process that uh, the lobbyists are, are attacking. Maybe it will help you understand that it's not that, uh, not that bad as it might seem from the corporate perspective. So uh, more than one year ago, Commissioner Vivian Redding, which is the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights, and that's not a coincidence that it was her, proposed a draft regulation, which is a new piece of European law, and it's a regulation, not a directive. So it's something that will be directly binding for all 27 member states. This is something that will replace uh, a legal landscape, which is very complicated today, if I were a company, I would think of that, that now I have to struggle with 27 legal orders and I will have one. And that new legal order is actually not that new. It's called data protection, which might sound a bit boring or geeky, but it's nothing less, nothing more than respecting our fundamental right to privacy, which we have in many charters, which we have in our constitutions, and which we had for some time in the EU. So it's not pushing that further, it's just making sure that the same law, that the same legal order that we had for last 20 years will apply in the changing world. 
What happened in the meantime? We had internet in the meantime. When they invented the data protection directive 20 years ago, internet was something really for geeks and for scientists. Now, as you might have noticed, it's kind of everywhere. So the, the new regulation is just trying to jump to the new state of technology, which I must admit from the company's perspective means probably a little bit more obligations in the world that they, uh, that they operate in. What is also quite interesting, intriguing, and I would say crucial in that change is that Commissioner Redding is trying to create regulation not only for the EU. She noticed that internet is global and that many of these companies are based in the US. And until now, they were not regulated in the same way. So if I, if I was a European company, I would very much welcome that new concept of creating a fair level playing field for US and European companies, right? So this is this kind of landscape that we are creating and the landscape where the privacy is still <laughs> as central as in the Constitution. <laughs> privacy, schmivacy. I mean, <laughs> look at it. Those US corporations are unregulated and they succeed, you know? No, no regulation means success, it works. I mean, look at everyone. Everyone is using Facebook, right? People. People are happy, yes, yes, everyone is using it. <laughs> Bear with me one second. <laughs> everyone is using it, and, and they, they seem to be happy about it. I mean, you Do get... They? Yeah, you get new friends and stuff, and you can play with and a farm. And you can show your breakfast at the whole world. Yeah, you can show pictures of your breakfast. You can play with animals in a farm, you know, and the pigs and the stuff, and, and it's great. So, I mean, what, 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 people understand what's going on. You, we, we should not... Ah, quit with this nanny state thing already. I mean, people are grown-ups, you know, they, they understand the technology, okay? Those computer systems are not that complex. Everybody understands the internet. It's a series of tubes. So people know what they're doing. They just click, I accept, and they accept those contracts. I mean, it's not complicated. Everybody understands contracts. So they perfectly know what they disclose to this, these companies. They perfectly know that just visiting a web page with a like button, not clicking it, just viewing the like button, disclose to Facebook information about what page they look online. Of course, they understand that. Okay, they're not stupid. Why would they need such a regulation? Hmm, let me think. Do you think that they still understand the terms of the contract if they change every week and they are yeah. longer than a phone book, the old school one, the, that fake one? The paper one? The well. paper one, yeah. I know they don't no longer use paper, but I'm kind of worried that they might not fully understand the consequences of storing all the traces they leave. Because it's not only storing the traces we leave consciously. Huh. It's not only storing the data that I give to Facebook or I think I give to Facebook. It's not only that, that no matter what privacy policy I adopt in my Facebook page, Facebook knows obviously everything. But Facebook knows much more than that, right? Probably you know, but maybe you don't know that the recent survey from many academic uh, centers, including Cambridge and MIT, showed that just by collecting pieces of our traces online, like the website we visited, like the website we liked, uh, one can detect very sensitive data. For example, I don't disclose my sexual orientation, but on the basis of where I click, that thing can be established by 85%. I don't disclose my racial or uh, ethnic origin or my IQ online. I don't put it there as an information, yet it can be uh, detected from the traces I leave online. And all this very sensitive information about my private life, about my moods, about my habits, about my weak spots, can be detected and can be and is used for what is it used? For commercializing and monetizing my data. But that's just the first step. How they commercialize and monetize it. F very, very often, they offer more expensive services to me, and I have no choice on demanding less expensive service because I don't know that I'm being offered the more expensive service. Or I live in my filter bubble. I'm being offered only the information that is designed for my profile. I don't even know, unless I'm a hardcore geek, but as you are. you're consenting, right? Well, yeah, consent is another thing. Now, most of the American companies, are also European companies, they imply consent. By the mere fact that they see me on the website, visiting the website, they say, oh, you are here, so you consented to terms and conditions. That's the catch-22. I never had really the choice of visiting the website with my consent for not revealing certain data. And I'm not really told what data I reveal. 
Nobody is discussing this with me because it's not the contract I can negotiate. So obviously we could think of this as a fair exchange of privacy for a service, but it's not fair as long as I don't know what the exchange is about and what's the, the real threat on the other side. And that's more or less why Reading proposed a few, let's say I will give you five major changes. So she, ha she said explicit consent should be the rule. If you consent, consent is consent, nothing less than that, right? So if somebody wants your data, they really need to ask you this question. And if you say no, they have to offer you the service without certain tracing being built in. Second big thing, uh, profiling, right? Profiling will be regulated. Not profiling as such, but decisions made on the basis of profiling. So for example, the price discrimination I mentioned and stuff like this will not really be possible without you being aware, without you consenting or without the law requiring that. Uh, then information, and now, well, I cannot read that stuff. I really tried, and I'm a lawyer. But now they will be ob the companies will be obliged to give you information in a very concise, very easy to absorb format, which is understandable for, for average internet user, not only for legal experts. Then co new concepts like privacy by default. So wherever you go to the new service, the default settings will be protecting your privacy in a maximum level. And only if you want less, you might want less, you might want to trade your privacy for your new services, no problem with that. But you do this choice, not huh. company for you. Huh. Well, privacy by default. I can have privacy by default if I want. I mean, I'm a hacker. Uh, in the original sense of the term, you know, not a criminal who breaks stuff, but somebody curious about technology who builds stuff. And so I know how to use the stuff, you know? I use encryption, yeah? I use GPG encryption for my email. I use OTR encryption for my chat. You do that also, right? I do this because all communication should be encrypted. That's the only way to have privacy by default, to have privacy by design, to be sure that only you and the people you're speaking to will know what it's about, okay? I use encryption as I do use free software because I know that software that you can control, rather that software that controls you, is the only way to go towards a free society because I listened to Eben Moglen's talk on Republica 12. So I know this kind of stuff. Why should I care? Why should I? care about data protection regulation? Maybe because not everybody wants to be, wants to hide in an encrypted world and go into this race of arms with corporations, with corporate surveillance and hide behind new technologies and rely on their wisdom and their skills. Some people might actually like to use Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Google and all these new comfortable services, they might want to regain control over the service they use and actually use the comfortable service. So that's personal choice, but not everybody wants to follow that path. But there is even something more. Well, you mentioned Eben Moglen. Uh, Eben said a few years back that, well, net is our neighborhood. And do we really want to live in the neighborhood where on every tree we have a surveillance camera, on every bush we have a mic, and uh, we have a data miner under every place where we put our feet? According to Eben Mogan, this is the world we live in. Recently, Bruce Schneier wrote a brilliant piece claiming that internet is a surveillance state. Do we like it or not? We live in a surveillance state. For you, it might be a game, a nice game that you win. But think of all the people who either don't have your skills or who might actually have a, be in danger from other governments. Do you know that all the companies that you use, services you use, they also disclose your data to other governments today and they are forced to do so. Even if they want to avoid it, the laws they are, they are obliged by, they force mm -hmm. them to reveal data of activists, of bloggers, of political activists. All this happens. So the talk about data protection, the talk about privacy is just the talk about internet freedom in the way we understand it. Is the talk about the, 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 the information society we want to design for future generations. It might sound a bit overblown, but you know, this kind of legal order is created once every 20 years, right? So now we talk about the design of the internet world for the next 20 years to come. Think of fin financial sector 20 years ago. Who thought back then that we will have a serious economic crisis caused by uh, speculation in, in, in all the derivatives and all the 
new financial instruments. Today, everybody talks about data as the new currency of the world. And everybody seems to be so optimistic about abusing, speculating, uh, creating economic value over this data. But what will come in the next 10, 20 years? So we are really talking not our egocentric business, the hacker, but about the society and about implications of this model, also for your wallet, for your, if you think about your egocentric perspective, about hmm. your money in the next 10 years to come. You know what? I think you almost get me convinced. <laughs> almost, almost. And hmm, it's really food for thought, yeah. And, and I was wondering now, so just imagine for one second that I wasn't the egocentric, bastardish hacker that I am, you know? Just imagine that I wanted to regain control over my personal data, about the traces of everything I do online and offline. Uh, I don't know, consider that maybe if inspired by what happened last year with ACTA, which Mind. everybody thought was impossible to defeat. But we de that we defeated anyway, that we beat by 478 against 39, where we beat 39 governments plus Hollywood plus Big Pharma, who is just our keyboards and, you know, a bit of lulls. So, hmm, if I was one of these people interested in fighting for getting back control over personal data, trying to, to regulate this form of corporate surveillance that is happening every day, what could I do? I mean, I, I heard there was this uh, European Parliament mumbo jumbo, it's complicated stuff. I heard there were votes already, opinion votes, that all were like, all the opinions votes were aligned with what the industry is requesting. And I heard that there is one main committee, the Civil Liberty Committee, that will cast its vote in a few weeks. So, uh, it, is there something I, I would be able to do if I wasn't the selfish bastard I am? Well, that's a very good question because, in fact, ACTA was a piece of the cake compared to this one because it's uh, 100 pages long, it has 100 articles, it's that complicated that nobody really gets a grasp of over everything, and there is not a single industry that would not be involved in fighting this regulation because not a single industry seems to be responsible enough to think in the long term about uh, not speculating on our data. So yes, the case is quite complicated and indeed we lost five votes already, which were opinion votes. And now the crucial vote is coming up quite quickly. It was scheduled for the end of this month in Brussels, end of May. It might be the case that they postponed it because it's so complicated that even the MEPs feel quite lost in all that dossier. Ha. So, well, what we can do really, we can, in the first place, let them know that we know about that happening and that we care, that we actually care about something we define as privacy. In a broad sense, we care about our control over our data, that we care about surveillance, that we don't want to be surveilled by companies without our awareness, without our instruments to fight back. So if we want to let them know, uh, I do think it's quite enough to call them or email them saying, we know it's going on and we know your responsibility, dear mm -hmm. representatives, and we trust that you will vote in favor of our rights. That's the first step. If you are asked back for details or if you want to know details, and there are details, unfortunately, it's not just yes or no, you might use the knowledge which is collected by many organizations under the umbrella of European digital rights. You might have heard of Privacy International, about the Digitale Gesellschaft, about Bits of Freedom, about La Codature du Net, about Panopticon, uh, Panopticon Foundation, Foundation Open about Rights Group. Open Rights Group. So there are quite a few doing that job for you, collecting all the amendments, analyzing the 100 articles, giving pages, pages of comments, hundreds, hundreds of pages of comments. So they actually have the knowledge. If you want that knowledge, you can use it. Or you can just say, dear MEPs, refer to the organization I trust and follow their advice. That's the minimum you can do. Do you think people could, I don't know, blog about it? If they blog. Do you, do you think they could, I don't know, maybe speak about it on, on Facebook? Maybe... Speak Facebook to knows anyway, but yeah, you can always. Maybe go and look for the members of the Civil Liberties Committee of the European Parliament on, on Facebook. Facebook and on Twitter and talk to them and tell them, well, there is something you have to do. And oh, by the way, there are elections in a few months. 
There are. Or things like and that. And that turns out to be the best argument. Do, so do, don't do forget think, to use that one. Do you think really that we, the people, are able to take back some of this hyper-concentrated power in the hands of the few companies? And uh, do you think this could happen? Well, I wouldn't spend last two years on this dossier if I didn't, but let us hear what others think. Oh, I really want to know what you think about it, and do you think that you can? Tell maybe, us. Maybe it's <laughs> worth trying, after all. Ah, I, thi I think it yeah. is. Yeah, what do you think? <laughs> huh. Up to you. OK, <laughs> it's up to you, yeah. <laughs> Three minutes left. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Or for statements of action. <laughs> postcards. Oh, there is action. Yes, we were asked about postcards. Yes, I heard of very, very cool people <laughs> writing postcards uh, about taking control of your data. And I also heard that they were right here next to the door. So you, you can could send postcards to the parliament. So you could just get started by writing a postcard in the very next minutes, for instance. There's a question here? Is, there's, there's, oh, there's a question here and then a question there. We don't really see it. Um, I suppose I'm a bad guy, too. I work for a social media agency. Can you speak louder? Uh, okay. I'm a bad guy, too. Uh -huh. I'm a real bad guy. I work for a social media agency. And we use data. We research to whom we can, could sell stuff. And I suppose that uh, perhaps we pay for around about all of your Facebook accounts, or our customers do it, not we ourselves. They pay us too. And I ask myself, I'm, I'm very, as a person, I'm very concerned with what you're saying. But as a bad guy, I ask you, what's happening if uh, we can't work anymore? Because Really, I'm not interested in any of you personal. I'm just interested in some groups of you I could sell stuff to, so your Facebook account is paid, and perhaps your Twitter account or your YouTube views or anything you use online. So how do we well, change this? Well, I, I, I could shortly answer this one. Uh, first of all, if it was to pay for a Twitter account or to pay for a Facebook account, I'd be very curious to see the price of it the actual cost of it. And then people could put in the balance either to pay that cost or to repay that with some of their personal data over which they would have control, and they would decide that this much data is worth that much of a service. So this would be a form of consent. Then on the question of business, you may have the impression that advertisement is some kind of bubble. What when it bursts? So there are ways of providing personalized service that is totally compatible with everything that has been proposed by the European Commission. But more than that, what could be done is to create the conditions for the emergence of a European trust-based internet economy, where instead of trying to compete with the US in the far west version of just snatching all the data, we would invent something a bit more subtle where you would come to all service because you know it's in the EU. Therefore, you know we will respect you. And this has a tremendous value. And we could build value out of trust rather than out of snatching personal data. That's your question here. Uh, uh, hi. hi, Jeremy. Um, it was a nice talk from both of you. Thank you. It's more a call of action to all interested in uh, privacy online and stuff. It's, about, it's, it's now three years that we saw Diaspora, um, the first attempt to get an alternative uh, social network. Um, now we got app.net as, um, as, as the next alternative. alternative. And yeah, uh, since we all should do the best we can to support online uh, privacy. I'm currently building my own pro project. It's called privacy.com. Um, I'm in the process of making a crowdfunding, uh, crowdfunding campaign. And uh, I'm calling you, the, uh, I'm here um, on Wednesday with a, with a cam and I want to make some short videos about the statements regarding online privacy. And yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to say. And 
All the best to f uh, for you, Jerry. Maybe you're interested too. It would uh, really cool you uh, to have you uh, on the video too. Thank you. Sure. Thank sure. you. Sure. We should we should hack keep on hacking society. We should keep on hacking the law. But it's also very important that we keep on hacking code, free as free software code, because it's the only way that we can preserve this bubble of freedom in in the online environment. So please keep on keep on hacking. Keep on hacking. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ben Posh, and I am working on something that I think will solve pretty much everything that you've just mentioned. It's called Stack.fm, and you should go check it out. Uh, can you speak closer to the mic? Uh, uh, yeah, OK, I'm kissing it now. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on something that uh, is going to solve what you guys are talking about, and it's called Stack.fm. It's a social network. OK. So yeah, check it out. Uh, keep on hacking. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have statements of action. That's even yes, better yes. than I expected. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all.